This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, crowdfunders? Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. On this show, as you know, we talk about crowdfunding. We talk about raising money for new products. We talk about also for business and entrepreneurship. How do you actually start one of your own? How do you start your own business? Um, what can you do to stay clear of some of the major pitfalls that are out there? That's what I like to share with you on the show from real world experience, from real world entrepreneurs that are out there that are killing it. They're kicking ass. They're taking names. Um, they're, they're connecting with huge audiences. Today's interview. I actually interviewed someone who has done over 16, created 16 more than that um, Kickstarter campaigns for his company, also many more for his own brand. Um, so it's, it's insane to me that we're starting to see Kickstarter veterans emerge, people who have raised dozens and dozens of projects, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's really become an ecosystem. And also a lot of these creators continue to return to Kickstarter because it is just such an amazing source of marketing, of people able to discover you, also you connecting with that early adopter community. So it's a really special thing. And I want you to listen today, for, particularly for some of the, the things that this creator has shared when it comes to things like add-ons, when it comes to stretch goals, all the other ways that we don't really always mention that you can actually um, upsell people or get more revenue from your actual crowdfunding campaign. So I think you're going to like today's episode for some of those types of tips that he shared. And also just some of the stuff he's experienced from running all these different projects, um, some of the things that he would have done better. And also, as always, the marketing advice that I think is just invaluable. Those of you that are listening to this right now, and maybe you're in the car, maybe you're um, listening to this on the way to work, in the subway, wherever you are, first of all, I want to thank you for, for supporting my work, for sharing this podcast, for subscribing, for leaving an iTunes review. That always means the world to me. If you want to stay connected in a more, I guess, a personal way, and also hear, get your voice heard more, and in addition, get access to some of the other stuff that I'm working on, some of the new articles that I have coming out on my blog, Crowd Crux, um, some of the new YouTube videos that I'm putting out, some of the other content that I'm putting together for you, and also announcements when I do a web class, like that kind of stuff, um, you can go to this link that I'm about to mention, and you will join my weekly crowdfunding newsletter. This is killer crowdfunding tips from Sal. Um, All you have to do is enter your address, your email address, and I'll start sending you weekly um, newsletter updates, things that are going on in my life. And mainly, though, I would say it's more focused on education and, and crowdfunding advice and tips and strategies. Strategies. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can go to this link, crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. I know that I said that fast, so let me spell that out for you. C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash subscribe. Crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Just go to that link, enter your email address, and I'll start sending you personal emails from me. Again, if you want to, um, you can reply to any of those emails. I can't guarantee that I will reply to you just because I have a large volume inflow. I have a lot of other stuff going on in my life. I run a business, etc. But I do try to read every single reply to the emails that I send out. And uh, at least if I don't reply, you'll know that your voice was heard and I did see your message. So that link finally is crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. I have here with you today a Kickstarter veteran, someone who's raised money with a bunch of different projects. I'll let him tell you a little bit more about that, but his most recent one um, has raised over $200,000 on Kickstarter, over 2,000 backers, really successful 
Um, I'll let him tell you a little bit about that. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So how many how many projects have you actually had your hands in or worked on over the years? I've done, I think uh, when we looked, it was about 15 projects personally at the office. We've done 16 projects. And then on top of that, I helped Tops. I spent a day with them discussing the Mars Attacks card project they ran a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I think it was 2014, I went out and spent a day with the guys called the Four Horsemen. They're a toy sculpting team. And I spent a day with them going over their first Kickstarter project. So I've touched several. Jeez, that's a lot. Um, so you have basically, you've done your own projects and then under your, your company. Could you tell the listeners a little bit about this company that you have that you've done different uh, campaigns with? Sure. I'm the CEO of Steve Jackson Games. I report to the one stockholder in the company, Steve Jackson. <laughs> uh, he started the company in 1980. We ran our first Kickstarter project in 2012. That closed at over $900,000. And if there was a mistake to make, we found it. And then we created some new mistakes all our own. So you basically built this. Did you build this company on Kickstarter? Or it was primarily, I guess, you were already selling games and then you discovered this new way to um, bring your customers value? Yeah, Steve's been publishing and selling games since 1980. I joined the company in 1999, and in 2012, when we ran, when we ran our first Kickstarter project, it was for a game that we weren't getting a lot of excitement or interest out of the distribution channels, but we knew fans wanted it, mm-hmm. so we decided to take a shot on Kickstarter and just learn, and fortunately, over 5,000 people backed the project for close to a million dollars. That's insane, man. So you've been you've been focused here on games with the company. What about with your your personal crowdfunding campaigns? Uh, my personal campaigns have been mostly books about toys. I run a toy website where I talk about the history of toys, post reviews, um, old newspaper articles, things like that. And then I've published uh, several different books, either focused on marketing of toys in the eighties. Uh, toy advertisements, some just reference guides where I photographed a bunch of toys. And that has been 11 or 12 books right there. And then I tried a little short story, a flash fiction project just for something fun. And right now I'm doing role playing uh, game cards, a little accessory pack, Mm. just as a little side project while running the big office Kickstarter project. So having been, you know, you have a successful company, um, having also done your, your own work, why is it that you just don't release these on your, your own private website or just announce this to like your existing customers? Why do you continue to come back to Kickstarter to announce these cool new products? Kickstarter has become such a strong marketing tool that we actually see a larger spike in sales and interest from a project on Kickstarter than many that we take a more traditional route, including to the point um, we took a Munchkin game to Kickstarter a couple years ago, Munchkin Shakespeare. It's a title we had talked to some distributors. We had talked to one retail chain about it as, as an exclusive item, and everybody was very lukewarm to the idea. So we decided, all right, well, if distribution, retailers, if the traditional channel is kind of meh about Munchkin Shakespeare, we'll go direct to the fans and ask. And that was about $300,000 in support, just under $300,000. And after that, we ended up selling twice as many copies into distribution as we would have without the Kickstarter project. Wow. So it's almost like cutting out the middleman there. And even by doing that, um, it's created way more hype and way more visibility than you did your own like private, I guess, launch, if you will. Um, right. And it helps you stand out. There's thousands of games being published every year right now. Hmm. And it's hard to be seen at times. Kickstarter it helps elevate the visibility of the project and it helps us better control our numbers. Because if we don't get a lot of support, then we don't print a lot of excess copies. For example, we put a game on Kickstarter 
early this year called Triplanetary. It was first published in 1973, and the Kickstarter project closed at about 1,000 backers. So we decided, okay, we won't print 10,000. We ran a very small number, fulfilled the Kickstarter project, and we've now sold basically everything that we have left through distribution. I think we have like 50 copies in the warehouse or something. Mm -hmm. So that if we had just taken a traditional model and printed five or 10,000 copies, we'd still be sitting on 5,000 or so, something like that. True, true. Uh, I think we'll circle out where this way we managed to gauge the size of the market, print to the demand, get in and out. Mm -hmm. And you guys are very familiar with, with this whole process. I think one of the, the hallmarks, if you will, of a good company is that you document your various processes. It's kind of like the most boring part, honestly, at least I think it is. Um, but you like you document what you're going to do for a launch. You document what people have to do in particular roles. Um, do you have something like that, like going into all these different campaigns? You know you have to hit like X, Y, and Z if this is going to be successful? Yes. Um, so going into it, before we launch a campaign, we've already spent months – either in just working on the projects. We have art, we have the game design done, and mostly ready to go. For example, we ran a project earlier this year for Munchkin Unicorns and Friends. It's a little Munchkin expansion. We sent that to print the like day or two days before the Kickstarter project closed because we had all of the work done. We hit a point where all of the stretch goals were unlocked, so there was no more changes. We did our final reviews, sent it off to the factory, and that allowed us to start on the manufacturing process as the Kickstarter project was closing down, which means we'll be able to deliver the expansion to backers before the end of this year. That's, that's incredibly well planning. Um, kudos on that. Thank when, you. When it, when it comes to also the planning, and it kind of sounds strange, but like the planning of the hype or like the planning of getting people interested in this actual game, um, were you doing anything along that front, getting people eager to, to hear about this announcement or wanting to back it and, and really even just getting invested in those stretch goals? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's something I don't think we're doing as good of a job as we could. We're still learning Um for the longest time, we didn't want to do a lot of promotion of a Kickstarter project before it launched because we were still finding our way on how to manage a Kickstarter project. I don't think we're experts at it, but I think we've got a pretty good rhythm down now on the actual running of a Kickstarter project and fulfillment. So we're starting to turn more attention to the promotion before the project. What are some of those things that you are looking to explore more of um, when it comes to the promotion of, of that project? Being able to set a date about a month out so that we can tell people, hey, one month from now, this will be the launch date for the Kickstarter project. Uh, for the run up to the fantasy trip, the project that closes in about four days, we did several interviews. We lined up Steve, I think it was about a dozen or so interviews before the Kickstarter project even launched to start getting the word out there. We ran demos at Origins, one of the big game conventions, the month before the Kickstarter project launched. We constructed an entirely new website just for the game and started posting articles about the game and just tried to keep building up to the launch date. Mm -hmm. When it comes to other stuff like Facebook ads, did you do any kind of like paid media or like advertising on, I don't know, Board Game, game Geek or something like that? Not before the project launched, but we had the um, Facebook promoted posts, the marketing there ready to go before the Kickstarter project launched so that when it hit, we could just push the button and start promoting one bit of Facebook promotion that we didn't pre-plan and just kind of worked out nicely was there's a solo board game group on Facebook that we talked to after the project had launched and we ended up having a week as their top banner image on their page and they did some promotion for us that way. So the pre-Kickstarter hype is definitely an area we need to do a lot of work on. We're not there yet. 
But even so, just being able to create a quality product, the results have clearly shown that you've done really well on Kickstarter just having a good product and just, I guess, relying on word of mouth, you know? Yes. I think that's sort of at the end of the day, um, all that matters is also when someone gets that product in their hands, they get to play the board game, they get to play the tabletop game and be able to have fun with their friends. That's what kind of creates the memory where it's like, okay, they're doing another project. I totally want to support this. Or like, what, what do they have going on now? Right. And that's one of the benefits to Steve Jackson games, having that 20, 30 plus year history, yeah, over 30 years before doing a Kickstarter project in 2012 we already had an existing audience. We had people who knew our games. So when we ran that first Kickstarter project for Ogre, people did have an expectation that we would get it right and we would deliver. Uh, we were horribly late on that one because it was our first Kickstarter project and we completely didn't plan properly for it. But I think by the time we did ship the project, once people received their games, it was such a huge ridiculous just mind-blowing box of stuff that they could overlook some of the delays as as your role here it seems like you almost have the role of organization and leadership um is it, first of all is that true but also how many people do you have working on this team when when you're launching one of these new projects for a kickstarter project it's everywhere from six to twelve of us at the office managing it mm. uh, preparing, getting the materials up, and then constructing the Kickstarter page. What is the challenge for you then? Is it getting everyone on the same page? Is it getting them like excited about doing this? What is really the, the big challenge or like the big thing that you're always for these projects having to tackle? Definitely getting everyone on the same page is one of the biggest challenges. For example, for this current project, uh, back in May, we constructed a project calendar, a pre-Kickstarter and Kickstarter and post-Kickstarter calendar. And this went day by day with names attached of tasks that had to be completed. So those tasks could be things like uploading the graphics, um, finalizing the rewards, uploading the video, that kind of stuff? That kind of stuff. And also outreach, arranging interviews, making sure blog posts about the game are, are go online, having new articles about the game go online and just sharing all that information through our social media channels and different blogs and website forums. So the number one thing there was, was having that calendar to get people aligned. Did you do anything else to get people on the same page? No, the calendar was the biggest part. I mean, we've had a few sit down meetings where everybody gets together and we go over the status. For example, last Thursday we sat down and went over the status of the game components, every single piece, what's finished, what's still in production, what's still awaiting art, just so everybody's on the same page. But the calendars we created in advance of the project really helped keep us all on the same page. And the calendars aren't, this thing must happen at this date in many instances. They're mostly designed around, hey, this needs to happen around here. Mm, okay. Okay. So it's sort of like, uh, these are the different phases or like, this is the stages of the campaign as it evolves. Right. And once the Kickstarter project hit the calendar we had created for during the Kickstarter project at one point just became a, well, this is a good guide, but we're definitely no way going to follow this because one of the challenges with a Kickstarter project is keeping the excitement up, not just with everyone working on it, but the community of supporters. And since we have no way of knowing for sure, like how many people are going to join in, how much money there's going to be, how fast stretch goals will fall. There's a lot of just reacting and adapting to the situation at hand. Um, for example, if somebody writes a really nice blog post about the game, there's no way we knew that was going to happen, but we need to be able to get over there, thank them, share it if it's something really cool that we like, and just deal with reality as it hits. And yeah, yeah. It hits hard on Kickstarter. I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at The Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month 
They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. As the leader of the group here and sort of having that, that common vision, um, were you then, I guess, having like touch points with everyone? Like you were making sure that everyone was doing their, ro- their work, you were communicating with everyone. Did you then like sort of have the final say like, okay, this video is complete or did you just like rely on the various teammates to, to know their craft and, and sort of, I think that's kind of you know anxious, honestly, but allow them to, to say, yeah, this is the video, this is perfect. Or did you like also have, um, I guess, a say or like the final say there? The majority of things Steve and I both would have final say over. Um, some things like Kickstarter updates, uh, stretch goals. I did most of that planning and work myself. And if I thought something was a little odd, then I'd consult with Steve or somebody else on the team. But the majority of stuff has been me and Steve together doing final approvals. Fortunately, like the video, I think we changed two or three words in the video so that wasn't a big deal and the uh, social media promotion things like that hunter our uh, community manager he just handles all that i don't go and look at it steve doesn't look at it i mean we see it after the fact but we don't approve what he's doing because he's got that down he knows what he's doing well when you're when you're actually in that kind of a role and you're having to basically say yes or no um, I think there's always that 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 fear of making the wrong decision. And Kickstarter is something that's really new for a lot of people, particularly that are listening to this show. Did you have to educate yourself? Like, did you look at other board game projects, or was this kind of just drawing from your own knowledge of the board game industry over the years? I've been working in the role playing and board game industry since 1995, and I have backed over 500 Kickstarter projects personally. So I just I try and pay attention and learn to what other people are doing. So actually as like a strategy backing other projects, just to see how they they do their rewards, how they do, do their communications, what it feels like to be a backer, that might actually yes. be a good idea to get started. Um, if you're preparing to run your first Kickstarter campaign ever, you should definitely back a dozen or so projects, even if it's just at a couple bucks, so you can watch what's happening mm-hmm. and, see how not only do they build their project, but how do they react as the project is going on. And it's fun to pick a couple that you think look like failures. I mean, it's it's not fun to say, but you can look at a project sometimes and say, oh, that is never going to fund. But if you can get in early and back one of those, it's very educational to watch how they handle it, where you have someone like uh, Simon who does giant million dollar, multi million dollar projects with lots of minis. You should totally watch one of their projects because they know what they're doing. And you can learn a lot seeing not only how they handle the project updates, but how they interact with their backers. Well said, well said. When, when you're the, the head or at the helm of the ship, I guess, the, you're the captain of the ship, um, I think a lot of your, I guess, um, confidence comes from seeing that pledge meter go up and up and more and more people joining the campaign. But at the same time, um, there's this thing that you call the Kickstarter slump of death where in the middle there's loss of momentum. Sometimes you have some, dro- some backers drop off. Um, what, what is that like when, when people start to back out of a project or they, they rescind their pledge? What is that like? It used to really bother me because I thought that maybe I personally had done something wrong. But eventually I saw in enough Kickstarter projects that that's just a part of the process. And you can't dwell on people canceling their pledge or reducing their pledge because ultimately – we don't know why they did it. Maybe they don't like an update. Maybe they decided they don't like the look of the game. Or maybe they're just having problems at home and hit a financial rough spot and they have no choice. Um, what I would never do, though, is try and contact someone and say, hey, why'd you drop your pledge? That just feels to me like an invasion of privacy and it's their business. And if they want to come out and tell me I dropped my pledge because 
you said this thing that I don't like, then that's fine. I'll listen, but I don't think it's my place to chase them down and say, where'd your money go? Come back. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the similar note, um, one of the other things that's rarely talked about um, when it comes to Kickstarter are failed credit cards. After the campaign is finished, you know, technically you raised a bunch of money, but at the same time, a lot of your cards might not end up being processed or people might not, for whatever reason, be able to pledge that you might not be able to collect the money. What are your thoughts on that, on, on like failed credit cards? And is there a way to also um, sort of recoup that? So it's going to happen. It's like a few percentage points that you lose, which on a very big project, um, like the fantasy trip that we're running now, that's over $200,000. Losing one or two percent to credit card loss, while not enjoyable, isn't catastrophic. But if you're running a tiny project, like uh, one of my book projects, did uh, five or six thousand, and had a couple big backers where their credit card didn't. Uh, sorry, go through. Go through. Yeah, yeah brain broke. Um, <laughs> didn't process correctly. That actually did have an impact because it's like, oh, well, that's $450 I didn't get out of this $6,000 project. And on the personal projects, each one has been designed around, I want to make this thing. And since this is a hobby, I don't need to make a ton of money. So those get really tight. And several of them I end up personally spending like $200, $300 of my own money. But in the end, I have the book that I wanted, so I'm happy with that. Um, so it's really why are you using Kickstarter and how big is the project where that failed credit card comes into play? So it's something that you almost have to expect that people might drop off throughout the campaign or might decrease their pledge. Some people, a small percentage of their credit card might not be charged. So you either have to budget for that. It seems like if it's a small campaign or if it's a larger one, use some kind of software tool, maybe like Backerkit or something um, to help to try to get some of those failed credit cards and get them processed. Yeah, I was going to mention that uh, one of the ways to deal with that is to use Backerkit, at which point you could message the people whose credit cards failed um, using the Kickstarter tools and just say, hey, sorry you had uh, issues there, but just so you know, our Backerkit is open and now you can receive it this way. Because when those credit card fails happen, they stop receiving updates, they remove the project. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they don't know what's going on. So if you send them that message, some of them may actually appreciate it because they want the product. And credit card companies have weird things happen. You never know why it didn't process. Yeah. Uh, another another um, thing that I think also has not been talked about a lot or is kind of like a murky area is this concept of add-on items. And add-on items, that's also something obviously you can do with like software or with surveys. Can you tell the listeners, um, looking at your, your current campaign, there is an add-on item opportunity. W- what is that? And like, how do, what does that mean? You know, for someone who's just new, doesn't know what an add-on is. So on Kickstarter, you create re- reward levels and maybe it's $10, you get the PDF, $20, you get the book. But then you can also have, give me $50 and you can get this old book that I wrote 10 years ago or something. Um, So what happens is the backer goes in, they select the reward level they want. Oh, $20, I want to get the book. And then they say, but I also want to get this other book for 60. So when they select the $20, they then add 50 and just pledge for $70. Now, when the project ends... You, as the owner of the project, have no idea what this person wanted. Why did they give me $70 when they only selected the $20 reward? You could either use your survey to ask everyone, what add-ons did you want? I would advise against that because nobody fills out the surveys exactly the same, so... If you had that $50 add-on and sent out the survey, you might have 100 people, all who want that book, but say different things in the survey. Mm. And there's no easy way. Where if you use a pledge manager like Backerkit, you can create essentially a shopping cart where they can go in and select, I want this $50 add-on, I want this $20 add-on. And those can be significant Um 
especially after a project closes, I've seen some companies build shopping carts in backer kit that is essentially their entire product catalog because they have an audience who likes their work and this is a chance to sell some older games. And these are basically all add-ons, a way to sort of like upsell the existing pledge tier. Correct. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Why is it then you wouldn't just offer that as like a reward on Kickstarter? What why, you know, do make this like an add-on or something like that? We've done both. If it's something that we have limited inventory, say we only have like 200 copies of an older title, we will create a reward level that is the new thing being made plus the old thing that exists, but only 200 people can get that. Mm -hmm. If it is an item that we are either creating new as part of the Kickstarter project, like on the fantasy trip, we're making a GM screen. That's a brand new product. It's never existed. So we have zero inventory now. We're saying, oh, you can add the GM screen as an add-on because we'll collect the inventory information in backer kit and then ma manufacture to cover that. Okay, okay. I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign. We've actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at backerkit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. For, for those that are, um, you know, just kind of getting started with their business and also aren't as aware of like how crowdfunding works, how significant do you think these items are? Like the, the idea of a stretch goal or the idea of add-ons, like do these things actually add significant to the bottom line and the amount that you raise? They do. Uh, for example, the Munchkin Unicorns project that we ran uh, closed at about $68,000. And so far in new add-ons alone on Backer Kit has brought in another $20,000. Jeez. That's like so, a... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> My math is, looks, isn't so good there, but it's like a third of it, basically. Yeah. And those can really add up. And that uh, $20,000, the majority of it is in existing inventory that we didn't offer in Kickstarter because mm -hmm. we had limited amounts. But we knew when we opened the backer kit, we could say we have 100 of this thing available and you can put a limit in backer kit so then you don't oversell. Interesting. So this is kind of like a way to if you have an existing product catalog, and you you've, you know, maybe for whatever reason, you have some existing over inventory, you can um, monetize that and you can get that into the hands of your fans who might care about it and want to own it um, using add ons and using software like this. That's really yes. neat. And that's a very interesting strategy. Um, and as for stretch goals, um, you need to decide for yourself if you want to go down that path. And if you do, definitely plan those out in advance. It is way too easy in, a, in the middle of a project to say, oh, I need to create some more excitement. I'm going to make this stretch goal and put it here. But then you have to deliver on that if it meets. So mm -hmm. what the stretch goals can do is give your audience something to root for. So like right now we have a $300,000 stretch goal for the fantasy trip. The project's at 232,000. So it's a big stretch, but it, if it's met, we're going to pack a retro style version of the game into the reward level for, we have one called I want it all. And the people who have backed at that level, we've been creating some stretch goals and items that only go into that reward level. And that's both to generate some excitement, keep people talking about the project and incentivize people to go from a lower re reward level into the higher reward level. 
Mm, interesting. So I want to ask you a little bit more about um, the fantasy trip and also where people can go and check that out. But uh, before we do, I had one one more question here. I think we're sort of seeing a renaissance when it comes to tabletop games, board games on Kickstarter, and just in terms of smaller titles in general. We're having more and more creators that are able to put out board games, connect with fans, get funding, and really get this into the hands of people. And you have more like niche games in a sense. It's almost like this whole movement, in my opinion. Um, when it comes to running a business around this, what are your thoughts on like the profitability of tabletop games, of, of starting a business um, in the tabletop game in industry a business at the moment could be a little difficult because there are so many games being published um but if it's a one-man operation you can totally create a business around running a one or two person operation and just producing games on kickstarter because your overhead will be low and you have direct access to a large community i think the last time i looked at kickstarter the games category was still the number one category on Kickstarter for funding. So there is a huge audience there of people. Lots of opportunity, uh, definitely. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about the traditional model of printing three, four, five thousand games, finding a distributor, finding retailers. Instead, you can just take your ideas to the fans, show them this is what I want to make. And they'll tell you, basically, mm. if they want it or not. And if they do, that's fantastic. Just make sure you have thought through every step of the process, especially the shipping. And one of the best ways, like you said, to start to get involved in that, if you are interested in producing your own games um, or doing your own types of projects, is to actually back other projects. So I would love it if you could tell us a little bit about the fantasy trip, um, if you could just tease it for us and get us, give us a sense of that. Cause I do think it's a really cool thing that you come out with and I want people to, to go and check it out. Sure. So the fantasy trip started in 1977. Uh, Steve Jackson, the owner of Steve Jackson games designed a game called melee. And then in 78, a game called wizard. These were little tactical combat games. Steve was playing D and D back in the seventies and he didn't like the combat system. He thought it was a little too, Freeform, not the attacking and tactical side that he wanted. So he designed these two little games, and as he worked on these, he realized this could be the core mechanics for a larger role-playing game. So The Fantasy Trip is that game, and it was published in 1980. And in 1980, Steve left the company that he was working with at the time called Metagaming and started his own company. He did not get to keep the rights to those games. So when that company went out of business in the early 80s, those games just got trapped. They wanted, I think it was something like a quarter million dollars from Steve to get the rights back. So for three and a half decades, Steve waited and had to work with our attorneys until there came a point where late last year he recovered the rights. Exciting. Yeah, three and so, a half. I mean – Going that that length of time, also considering that he put, I'm sure, his like heart and soul into that, um, yes. into that company, and then th literally 30 years later, now this is available to people. It's like you're bringing back his, his first work of art, if you will. Yeah. So his first game uh, was Ogre, and his second was Melee. So we're definitely bringing something back that people haven't been able to get for a long time. Steve played the the long game on this one. Mm -hmm. he, I remember talking necessarily to him about, so though. <laughs> yeah, but I remember like in the first year I was with the company talking to him about it, and even then it was a hopefully one day we can do this, and it's kind of exciting now. But what it is is the fantasy trip is a complete fantasy role playing game, and it uses a hex combat system. A lot of people compare GURPS, which is the role playing game Steve published in 1986 to the fantasy trip and consider GURPS to be an evolution of some of those ideas. But the cool thing about the fantasy trip is it's such a lighter game than GURPS and it does make a really fun tactical combat game. So even people who aren't into the role-playing game side of things and just want to have knockdown, drag out fights and adventures, the fantasy trip really supports that. 
Very cool. Very cool. Well, I urge you guys to go and check it out. The Fantasy Trip on Kickstarter. Um, can people also go to a URL to learn more about some of the other games that you have available? Yes, we have sjgames.com, which will open up and show you the hundreds of different titles that we've published over the years. Awesome. And even if you just back it for you know a few dollars just to see how this company does their marketing, does their video, does their communications, I think it's a really good opportunity um, because when you go on Kickstarter and you're doing your own, you can sort of draw from that wealth of knowledge and just seeing someone else that's done a lot of different games. You created 16 under this company just saying here. Um, you definitely guys, you know what you're doing. So I think that's a really great opportunity, but thank you so much, man, for coming on the show. Um, sharing all of these great insights, um, the, the thoughts that you had about add-ons, about stretch goals, etc. I really appreciate that and, and being transparent. And uh, I look, look forward to watching you over the next four days with your, with your campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Again, my name is Salvador Brigman. Thank you for joining me here today on the podcast episode and being a fly on the wall. I hope you took notes because I think this was a killer episode. A lot of great content, particularly on the way of add-ons, um, also on surveys, tools you can use. As a reminder, BackerKit is a sponsor of this podcast. Um, they're a great software tool. If you're interested, crowdcrocks.com slash BackerKit. Um, also, the one thing I wanted to say here is that I think that it's really cool to get the perspective of new people that are just now being introduced to crowdfunding Kickstarter. But at the same time, when you're listening to a veteran talk about it, it's it's so wild to me the fact that this has existed for the last several years. Like this has existed for the last six years, seven years, and people just haven't known about it. The fact that campaigns are regularly being funded, you're regularly getting people discovering your products. This company is regularly launching new products into the world via Kickstarter and they, they keep doing it because there's an inherently powerful marketplace built up on that platform. It's, it's very similar to Amazon. It is a marketplace. I think that says a lot. I think it says a tremendous amount about the opportunity that you are missing out on if you have never considered launching a crowdfunding campaign, if you haven't really done your homework when it comes to putting one together or how to actually construct a good launch. Um, you're really missing out because this is, this is like, I don't want to say like free money, but this is basically a free way that you can access and tap into an existing large group of people that are regularly supporting campaigns. So to me, it's a complete no brainer. It's probably one of the easiest ways um, to get the word out there nowadays when it comes to if you have a physical product or something that you've created and something that you want to get attention to. It's really a whole marketing exercise. It's kind of almost like a PR um, component, PR stunt, if you will, um, launching this campaign. You'll get way more press and attention than if you were to try to just launch this privately on your own website. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you do want more advice and tips, access to videos, access to new blog posts that I have coming out, new content updates, some stories, some things from my life that I share with you, um, stuff that's going on, like how I went on a sailboat for my birthday, uh, all this kind of stuff I like to share in the weekly crowdfunding tips newsletter. So you can go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe, enter your email address there, and I'll start sending you this weekly newsletter to you. And if you want to, you can reply to any of those emails that I send you. So basically, this link is crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash subscribe. Crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. Okay, guys, um, I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, take a second to rate us on iTunes. Let me know what you think. But I will have another episode out for you next week. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.